In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to study your word once more. Uh, Help us to open our hearts and minds to see how we are to live as people of faith uh, by the example of people of faith under the old covenant covenant who had their hope in the promise of the covenant to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so we're Hebrews chapter 11, which means we're going to be in the Old Testament again. A little bit. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews. And we only have one fun Greek word this week. As long as there's one. Next week we have none. And then we have a couple. Anyway. So Hebrews 11, 1 to 31. And that's it. It doesn't, the, the lectionary doesn't cover the last few verses and really don't need to because it's just a rehash. Okay, so now faith is one of my favorite verses of the Bible, actually. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed, by going out to a place where he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself received the ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore there was born even of one man, and him as good as dead, at that as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number, and innumerable as the sand by which is by the seashore. All these died in faith, without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding things to come. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was unseen. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as though they were passing through dry land, and the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish, along with those who were disobedient, after she had welcomed the spies in peace. Okay, that's a whole lot of Old Testament. Okay, so if you like doctrine, this chapter's got it. Okay, so 
Chapter 11 can be used as a lesson plan to teach just about every tenant of the Christian faith. It's got that much going on in it. Uh, commentators have called it the Hall of Faith uh, because it uses faith and its derivatives and synonyms over two dozen times in that passage we just read. Okay, it explains the form and the purpose of faith with all those examples of Old Testament saints who lived out their faith. So this is the beating heart of the preacher's sermon. So remember, this is all a sermon, one sermon, a long sermon. All right? And this is the heart of it right here, this chapter. Okay, so we're to live our lives of faith in imitation of the saints who are were patiently perseverant as they awaited the inheritance of the promises to come. And verses 1 and 2, if you ever listen to my sermons, I quote those two verses all the time. They're like every third sermon, I think those, those verses are in it because they're awesome. Okay, so right off the bat, we're going to get our Greek word. I need to get my cheater out. Okay. So what are we, Hebrews 11? Right there in verse 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Uh, can, uh, assurance, the assurance of things. The word, the noun, the assurance is a really cool word. It's hypostasis. And usually when we talk about hypostasis, we're talking about the hypostatic union of the two natures of Christ. So you've got his human nature and his divine nature. He's 100% God and 100% man at the same time. We call that the hypostatic union. It's a technical theological term. Uh, but when used as a noun, when it's used as an adjective in that case, but when it's used as a noun in Greek, it has two shades of meaning. And if we've learned anything about the, the preacher in Hebrews, every time he uses a word that has two meanings, he means both of them. We've seen that several times. Okay, so that's his brilliant custom is to mean both of these meanings simultaneously. So we have both an objective and a subjective meaning of assurance, this hypostasis. So objectively, it means the reality of something. And then subjectively, it means to hold a certain viewpoint about something. And he means both of them. So this assurance is a thing that stands on its own. right? So this assurance... That's something you feel, and that's subjective. So we hold that viewpoint. So God makes a promise, and we hold that viewpoint that he's going to keep that promise. That's subjective. But it's also objective when used as a noun. Hypostasis means it's an assurance that's a fact, regardless of what you believe. And the preacher means both of those at the same time. So it's something you believe and that you put your faith in. But it also means, regardless of whether you believe it or not, this is a true thing which is kind of neat. So, yeah, you have to believe it. But whether you believe it or not doesn't make it not true, which is kind of brilliant when you realize how long ago that was written and what a messed up world we have right now. Right? So when we talk about worldviews, so we talk about today's postmodernism, which started in the 60s, right around the time of the whole free love movement, Vatican II, all those changes in the world, sexual revolution, Postmodernism came in, and what postmodernism means is that there is no objective truth, only subjective truth. What truth? What is true to you? What's your truth? And we hear that still today, right? Well, I'm, I'm trying to find my truth. Well, there is an objective truth, God's truth, and then there's subjective truth, what we consider to be true. But postmodernism says, no, 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 there is no objective truth. It's, truth is what you make it. And if we're going to be rational beings, I have to acknowledge that your truth is your truth, even if it's not true for me. But my truth is my truth. And you have to acknowledge that my truth is equally valid. That's postmodernism. Sounds reasonable on the surface, but in reality, it means nothing means anything. Because all of a sudden, you see that happen. Words don't mean anything anymore. And now we're actually beginning to live in the era of post 
postmodernism, which is called meta postmodernism. And it's also called the, uh, in the art world, a lot of this stuff starts in the art world too, art movements. You can watch art movements happen. And when an art movement happens, something happens socially too. You know, so you had basically all your Renaissance artists, it was all realism, right? People look like people. And then, you know, guys like Van Gogh came around with Impressionism and everything was like, it still looks like what it is. It's a representation, but it's an interpretation of reality, right? So it's Impressionism. And, you know, that comes along right around, you know, the time of the Enlightenment. It's actually post-Enlightenment, but the Industrial Revolution, Revolution, there was things happening in the world when art took that shift. And in the beginning, people rejected it, right? It was like, this, this sucks. We're make paint people that look like real people. And then all of a sudden, everybody loves it. Everybody, Van Gogh is everybody's favorite artist, right? Okay, so meta postmodernism, it's also called the new obedience movement. And it's like, well, that sounds ominously fascist and <laughs> communist all at once. Yeah, because this new looking at reality is, you know, it's a communal, and I'm not describing it very well because I'm not that well schooled in the philosophy of meta postmodernism, but it's basically just postmodernism gone to its natural conclusion, which is nuts, which is there is no objective anything, but collectively we have to acknowledge that reality is what we perceive it to be. But that might not be the same for you. It sounds almost like postmodernism, but it's even more stupid. I didn't explain that very well, but just it's it's postmodernism on steroids. Okay. And it's brilliant because the preacher uses these two meanings which directly attack that philosophy 2,000 years ago. And it's like, well, here, this happened, and we have postmodernism and meta-postmodernism. And he's telling you, well, yeah, you're going to hold this view of what you are assured by, by God's promises. You are going to hold that in your heart, but regardless of what you believe, they exist, period. Objectively, it's a fact, because God said it. That's very not postmodern. That's anti-postmodern, anti-postmodern as you can get. And it's interesting that he means these two things uh, very subtly. Um, if you like study the grammar and everything, it's there. Uh, way beyond what we're trying to do here. Almost beyond me to comprehend. I have to read what smarter people than me have, have taken it apart and figured it out. Uh, but basically, He's talking about faith. He uses the word a couple dozen times. So faith is having a viewpoint rooted in reality of what we know is true. Right? It's not wishful thinking. Right. All right? At least when we're speaking biblically. All right? So it's a belief that understands some outcome is going to be certain, and despite it not being provable, which is the whole key, is we still accept a supernatural worldview, that there are things beyond nature, supernatural, beyond reason. Okay, now hope fits right next door. Right? And hope fits right next door. So this assurance, where we, we, our assurance is on something objective. We subjectively believe we have faith in it because we know objectively it's true because God said it. So regardless, this outcome is certain despite we can't prove it. It's like, well, Jesus is coming again. Prove it. Can't. But I have faith because I have an assurance of something I can't see yet. And he's going to prove this being the good way before postmodernism philosopher that he is. He is going to dissect the whole postmodern mindset in this chapter, starting now, using these examples of people who had their assurance and things they couldn't see because they weren't objectively provable but they had faith in them, and that's what saved them. Okay? So, if we look at Romans 8, 24, real quick. Romans 8, 24, which says, We hope, for in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he already sees. Brilliant. Okay, so it's Paul. 
For in hope we've been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes in what he already believes? Because faith is the assurance of things, hope for the conviction of things not seen. Wow. All right? And then we have another, I, I lied, we have two Greek words this week. So we have a verb. Uh, elikos. Oh, I'm sorry, it's another noun. Elikos? Elikos. Yeah. Elikos. Elikos. <coughs> and elikos is the act of presenting evidence for something being true. Yes. Okay, so it is the act of presenting the evidence for the truth of something. Can I get a corner? It is a legal term, yes. Okay. Yep. So, even though we have this uh, faith, which is belief in something that we know, an outcome we know is going to happen, even though we can't prove it, there is this act of presenting evidence for the truth, which is what he's about to do. He's like, well, we can't prove it, but here's the evidence of all these people who live that kind of life of faith, even though they couldn't prove it either. It's kind of what he's saying he's going to do. Uh, so he uses that, uh, that word specifically here. Okay? So that's verses 1 and 2. And then he says, okay, so how is he going to do that? How is he going to do that? He's going to do it for by men of old gained approval. So, uh, elegos, that's conviction, conviction. So we have assurance, hypostasis, and then conviction, elegos, elegos. So we're going to talk about the conviction, the, the proof. So a conviction is something you hold. It's evidence. You hold the evidence of the truth of something. And it's going to be the truth of this assurance we have, this hypostasis we have on something we can't see. How's he going to do that? Verse 2. For by it, the men of old gained approval. And that's how we do it too. Wow, we're on verse 3. Excellent. There's a lot in this chapter. That was just those two verses. So, verse 3. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Okay? So faith informs the Christian worldview. Our worldview is not just based on our senses, on human reason, because human reason is not complete. But our faith informs our worldview, our conviction of these things, these promises and assurances of God, especially the Son's involvement in creation, which is what the preacher just said. The worlds were prepared by the word of God. Okay, so how did God create the world? In the beginning, there was nothing, and God said. Yeah, God said. When God said, logos, the word, that's the second person of the Trinity, the creative act, is the son. Is the son. Oh, okay. okay. So he is the word, right? John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, capitalized, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Or without him, nothing was made that was made. And that's that line out of the Nicene Creed, I believe. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. And one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, being of one substance with the Father, by uh, being of one substance of the Father, begotten, not made. By whom all things were made. By whom all things were made. It's not talking about the Father. Right. It's talking the about the Son by whom all things were who made. Who is the Word? Who is the Word incarnate? The Word okay. and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So it's very strong in John's theology which John wrote his gospel in reaction to the heresy that came up immediately after the other three gospels were finished, which was that Jesus was not God. He was not the son of God. He was the son of God in that he was blessed. It was his faith. But he wasn't the actually God. Era. No, no, no. That's the, that is the Arian heresy. Arian. Okay. Yeah, it's Arianism. That's Arianism, Patrick. Yeah. Okay, so... Faith informs our worldview, particularly the Son's involvement in creation, and John 
one, one to three, like we just saw. You can also, if you want to whip out your Apocrypha, Serac 24 verses 1 to 23 deal with that. So that is the writings of Jesus, son of Serac, it's called. It's also called Ecclesiasticus, uh, depending on your translation. Uh, so it's a great big fat book out of the Apocrypha. It's got good stuff in it. Anytime in our hymnal, you'll see in the margins, it tells you what biblical text the lines of the liturgy come from. Every now and then, it'll just say liturgical text. If it says that, nine times out of ten, it comes from the book of Sirach in the Apocrypha. So that's where it comes from. It's good to read. Uh, there's second time I get to talk about Valerius Herberger today. Uh, Valerius Herberger wrote a comment, not a commentary, a sermon series. He wrote these things, he called them, he called them heart letters. They were like devotional sermons. You know, it wasn't, we wouldn't get up and preach them necessarily, but you would read them almost like a devotional book with a preaching quality to it. Uh, and he did that for a big chunk of the Bible, Genesis through Ruth. Uh, he also did all of the lectionary readings, the Old Testament epistles and gospels, or no, they didn't have Old Testament, as I said, just epistles and gospels for each Sunday and festival day. And he also did the entire book of Sirach, which is a lot of chapters. It's huge. It's like one of the prophets. It's a big book. Uh, so he wrote these devotional resources about it. Uh, it's good, very good to read. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom in it. Uh, kind of a weird take on women, which is why it's not canon. Because it's just kind of got a little bit, there's nothing really bad in it. Um, you're not going to point at anything and go, that's false doctrine. It's, it's good stuff. Okay, so, uh, Sirach 24, verses 1 to 23, and I mentioned this in a sermon three or four weeks ago, uh, talking about when you talk about uh, Torah and ingesting the word, eat the words, you know, let the word go in you. Uh, this chapter of Sirach talks about that. The Torah was the visible element of the presence of the divine word in the worship of the Old Covenant Church. Right? So you have the Torah, you have the, you know, the, the uh, Hebrew scriptures. Uh, that was the visible presence of the divine word of God because it was a book. You wrote down the words of God and you had them that you could see and touch. Right? And now the word is made flesh in Jesus Christ. So he is the visible presence of the divine word. He is the divine word. And it's just very rich, very rich language in that little verse. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. Okay? All right, now we get to the men of faith. So verse 4. By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, though through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Okay, so now Abel is a type of Christ, and you'll see even the, the preacher uses the word type. So a type is not a kind like we think. It's a, it's a typology. So when you see the people of Israel cross through the Red Sea. That is a typology of baptism, right? They went through the water and they came out alive. You know, they were going to die in Egypt. They came through the water and they lived, all right? So that's a typology of your rebirth and baptism. Um, Melchizedek bringing out bread and wine for Moses to eat Moses. Abraham to eat. I do that every time. For Abram to eat, that is a typology of the Lord's Supper to come. So it's just a for, it's a lesser version foreshadowing of something greater that will be fulfilled. Uh, so Cain, Ab I'm sorry, yeah, Cain, Abel. Abel is a typology of Christ. Okay, he was a righteous person who was sacrificed by his brothers murdering him. So it is a, that's Genesis 4, verses 3 to 7, if you want to uh, look at that. So Abel holds the first place in this cloud of witnesses, uh, which we'll hear about in chapter 12, so next week, or whenever we get to it. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, the preacher is going to come to his denouement after, uh, French, 
he's going to come to that after all the stuff he's going to tell us about in chapter 11. Chapter 12 is going to say, therefore, since we have all these witnesses, let's lay aside all of this other baggage we carry around that makes our faith weak and spongy. That's what he's going to get into next week. So Abel is a type of Christ, and he has first place. And he's a type of Christ because he is a word that still speaks. His blood cried out to God from the, from the ground. His word still speaks because his sacrifice was accepted. Cain's was not. Was it because Cain didn't offer, you know, hey, Abel, can I have some fat from your firstborn blemishless sacrifice because I'm just a farmer and all I've got is plants? No, that's not why his sacrifice was rejected. Abel gave his best, his first fruits of his flock, and that's why it was accepted. Cain did not. He just offered a sacrifice of whatever he wanted to. Probably kept the good stuff for himself. So that's why, because your heart wasn't in it, which normally we don't talk about. You've got to make sure your heart's in it. That's dangerous language for us Lutherans sometimes, because feelings, alarms go off. It's not about your feelings. Well, it is, because the intention of your heart was to, like, you're going to deceive God. Well, God's not going to care. I'm not going to give you a best. Well, yeah, he does, because that's what he wants. That's what he says he wants. Okay, so that blood still speaks. So his actions still speak. He's an example of, yes, I am going to offer the best of what I have. Because who cares what I have in this world? It's what the world to come is. Okay, so okay. Enough about him. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So did you catch that? That language is a little hard. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is possible, parentheses, possible to please, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Okay, so Enoch didn't taste death, but was assumed into heaven by God because he walked with God. And Enoch walked to God and he was not, it says. What does it mean he walked by God? He walked with God by faith. Just like Adam used to walk in the garden by faith until he didn't anymore. Enoch did. Um, It's interesting uh, that he he walked in faith with God for about 365 years before God took him. It's a long life. And I'll put any number, does that number 365 mean anything? Probably not. But he is the seventh generation from Adam, and I think that number is important because there's that number. Okay, so the number of God and the number of man, three and four, put them together, he gets seven. Uh, The number of perfection, that which only God can do, has done, or will do. Um, So now you see the negative a negative and a positive juxtaposition of Cain and Enoch. Okay, so Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain, and then Enoch was this pretty righteous dude. So God is the rewarder of the one of those who walk with him. Then we get to verse 7. Now we have Noah. By faith, Noah being warned about God about things not yet seen, a big flood coming. In reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. So Noah is our third example. He's the first to be called by the name, the word righteous. I just called Enoch righteous, but the preacher, this is the first guy he calls righteous. Usually we don't refer to people as being righteous. So why was he accounted as righteous? Because we're not righteous. Also perfect, the word perfect is in there in some translation. Verse 7, right? Maybe not perfect. Okay, he found favor with the Lord. Depends on the translation. Or am I looking at Genesis 6? Maybe it's in Genesis 6. Real quick. Let me, I'm going to look at Genesis 6 real quick. Verse 23, 6, 13, Genesis 6, 13. 
blah, blah, blah. Then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh is coming. Make yourself an ark of gopher word. Make sure it has rooms. Cover it so it's waterproof. This is how big it's going to be. Put a window in it. Put a door in it. Three stories tall. Behold, I'm bringing a flood. But I'll establish my covenant with you, and you'll enter the ark, you and your son, your wife, and you know, all that. And two of everything so we can repopulate the earth. And take everything that's edible for food, gather it to yourself. And so he did it. Okay. I don't know where I got that word perfect from. Ignore me. Right, but he found favor with the Lord, and that's why Noah picked him. Or why God picked Noah. Right? So he is not perfect because of his sinlessness. We see that in a big way after the flood, flood right? The he decides to become a vintner and uh, kind of hits the sauce a little much and uncovered his shame in front of uh, his family, which is bad. You can debate what that means. People argue about that and they get really kind of disgusting with some of the stuff they think it means. Um, but he found him here with the Lord, not by his sinlessness then, but his faith. Faith in the unseen prophetic word. So the words, the world's going to end, but God said, I'll make my covenant with you, which is the covenant. I'm not going to destroy the world this way a second time, but I'm going to destroy it this way the first time, so build this boat. And by faith, he did it. And that is why he was accounted as righteous, because of his faith that God was going to take him through this and make a covenant with him. Right now in verse 8, we're going to see three examples just about Abraham. Okay, just the life of Abraham. Okay, so first, faith is following God's call into the unknown, right? He said to Abram, I'm going to send you out here. You don't know anybody. There's going to be no friends, no family, no kin. Your people are not going to be there. But I want you to go live there, okay? Let's do it. Okay, God, I'll do that. All right, and then second... Faith is then residing as an alien in a foreign land, right? Stranger in a strange land. So, and that is a type of our faith. I'll come to what that means in a second. So, living as a stranger in a strange land, he had faith that God is going to take care of him there. And then thirdly, faith that God is going to continue his line through Isaac, even though God told him to kill him. We'll come back to Isaac. So living in a stranger in a strange land, that is a foreshadowing of the eschaton. I, like, sorry, third grade word. Uh, eschatology is the study of the end times, right? So the eschaton is the last day. Uh, and the, his faith in he's going he's gonna to live as a stranger in a strange land, but God is ultimately going to rescue him from being surrounded by you know, heathens is a foreshadowing of us and our hope in the last day, our hope in the coming eschaton, because we are aliens in a strange land. And there's no permanency to... Right, there's no, he's lived in tents. He's lived in tents, right. there was nothing. Yeah, it's not like he put up a house. It's not like he fenced he's in right. acreage. He's living in a tent like a Bedouin, right? Mm -hmm. A wanderer. But he has faith that God's going to take care of this. And that is what we do, because we are living in tents. We are strangers. If we're, if we're living a life of faith, I know we love the world, though, because we, and, and I'm going to hammer on that for a couple, three weeks here, and sermons coming up, because that's what the texts are about, partially. Well, they're always about that. They're always about that, because our biggest fight is with, you know, what are our big enemies? Sin, or sin, death, and the power of the devil. But our enemies are the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh. And the world is, well, why is the world our enemy? Because they hate us. So they don't want to hear the gospel. The gospel is foolishness, right? So we're aliens. We're supposed to be in, but not of the world, we say. But well, we're in it because we got to go out there and live in it, but we're not of it. We're set apart. You know, we're the ch God's chosen people. You know, we're not Jewish, but we are Christians. We are his chosen people. And we're, we're, boy, it's getting more and more foreign out there every day. Yeah. And all of this has happened before and all of this will happen again. 
It was exactly the same way in the early church. It's getting like that here. It's already like that in a lot of countries. It's getting like that in Finland. They've been in the news a lot like that. That poor dude that's like the bishop over there. I mean, I'm surprised they haven't burned him at the stake. I mean, they're really out to get him. They're actively persecuting Lutherans in Finland, which was a traditionally nationally Lutheran country. And that is what's happening in Scandinavia. It's happening here through our laws, the ballot box. Yep, oh, it's happening here. Yeah, and so it's just, it's just as devastating and just as... Yeah, and if you can yeah. see it, I mean, I don't want to sound like a doom and gloom TV preacher about the end is nigh, but the end is nigh. Mm-hmm. Come Lord Jesus, because holy Absolutely. crap, look at what's happening. The persecution is coming home. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I've said before, I've talked to I've talked to pastors from Ethiopia and from Nigeria, and they both said the Nigerian pastor said in 20 years we'll be sending missionaries to the United States. The Ethiopian guys I ate with a couple years ago said you better crank that back to 10. We'll be sending missionaries to you. And they're not wrong. Okay? So Abraham's example of living as a stranger in a foreign land and his assurance that God would deliver him points us toward the last day and our deliverance from the foreign land that is becoming increasingly foreign that we live in today. And they're making it, making it so easy. I don't know if you... Uh... Erwin Lutzer has written this book, and I'm reading it now. We will not be silenced, and it is—it's it, really a good book. It kind of smacks the hand of the church and it, for allowing, you know, being quiet and being silent. You know, now I'm going to speak up. <laughs> More than kind of like now or never. Pardon? It's kind of like now or never. Oh yeah. And they talk about the last days. That's something else. I don't want to go off on a rabbit trail anywhere, but uh, when they say the end times. we got to get you a pen that writes. <laughs> I picked up two in your pens, and two of them don't write. That there one should even light up. <laughs> there we go. Last charge. Thank you. Did you get it? No, that one and that one don't work. That one does. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Talking about how we're getting oh, more and more foreign. Yeah. Oh, we were t- oh, we were talking about the uh, end, end, end times. Mm-hmm. And I um, heard something interesting. You said that we talked about the end times now. The, end, uh, the last days, that's what it was. The mm-hmm. last days is what he was saying. The last days started at the uh, incarnation. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I would say at the ascension, but yeah. Yep. The, 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 yeah, the, end, the tribulation started, the tribulation and revelation started on the ascension day. Interesting. Or the, you could even you could also call it the millennium, the millennium in scare quotes. Mm-hmm. So the thousand year reign of the devil on earth began at the ascension and will continue until Jesus comes again. Yep. Yeah, you know, so that's why I say all these things have happened before. Like all that stuff in Revelation, it's happened already. And it's happening now, and it's gonna keep happening. Like the four horsemen, we see them all the time. They're they're riding, they've been riding for two thousand years. And they're going to keep writing, like death, pestilence, famine, war, tyranny. Do we have those things? Yes. Yeah. We've had them since the beginning, and we're going to keep out them. Exactly. Hey. So, yep. yeah, but our hope is that that will go away, finally. And you can look at, and our conclu- I guess a concluding thought about that second one is, uh, look at Psalm 87. First one. Or maybe I got two psalms. Actually, I'll give them to you now. No, I won't. I'm, I got two psalms for you. These are better ones. Oh, well. 87. Oh. First one. Yeah, just giving you that How one. That? Giving you that one with no context. That was a little not nice. I didn't actually mean to give you that psalm first. It's like, why but did I give her that did, one first? You did. Yeah. That was kind of like hitting somebody when they're down. I can hit you? Psalm 87.1, his foundation is the holy mountains. Did I mean the Septuagint? I hope I meant the Septuagint, which would be Psalm 86. Incline your ear. Yeah. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am afflicted and needy. That one. Not 
Mountains. The foundation is in the Holy Mountains. Dummy. Oh, well. Oh, yeah, I think I meant Psalm 86, which would be Psalm 87, 1 in the Septuagint, or that the backwards. Anyway, because the numbers are different. Uh, incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am afflicted and needy. So even though we're afflicted and needy, verse 2, preserve my soul, for I am a godly man. O you, my God, save your servant who trusts in you. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you I cry all day long. It's a great song. So it is Psalm 86, 1. Okay, and then ultimately faith in the conception and birth of Isaac. And so even though even though Sarah was old and she laughed, which is what Isaac's name means, uh, he still trusted that somehow this was going to happen. And even though God told him to sacrifice his son, so let's look at that. Let's look at Genesis twenty-two real quick. That one right. Okay, so offering of Isaac's cliff notes. Came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Take your son, your only son, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as burnt offering on one of the mountains. That I'll tell you. Okay. And then Isaac here is another, this is a typology of Christ. So let's look at all the parallels. So on the third day, uh, so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, Isaac his son. He split wood for the burnt offering and rose, went to the place which God had told him. On the third day, God raised his eyes. Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young men, stay here. Me and the boy are going to go over there. We'll be back. So he took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. So that's the cross, right? Took his hand, the fire, and the knife. The two of them walked together. And Isaac said, Hey, Dad, I see the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. Which he did. So they went, they came. Abraham built the ire, built the altar, built the fire, put his son on there, got ready to kill him, and then said, Don't and then produced a sacrifice in substitute for Isaac, which now the lamb, the ram is Christ, because Christ is the substitutionary atonement. In that case, Isaac is us, and then Christ is the substitute. Uh, and you notice how long the journey took? Three days. Three days. Three days, yep. So, a little on the nose. Right now, back to Hebrews, now, I know, verse 11, to 13, 13 to 15. So regardless, all these things, Abraham kept his faith, even though God kept giving him some pretty sketchy stuff, like normally we would go, mm, I'm not you sure I trust me, in this. You gave me this and you're going to take it away? Yeah. It's like, hey, I got a friend of mine I want you to meet. His name is Job. Why don't you talk to him? Oh, yeah, never mind. <laughs> I had all this. Like, oh, yeah. Sorry. All right, so now 13 to 15, verses 13 to 15 is an extended explanation of how Abraham's faith has an eschatological nature, as well as Isaac and Jacob, who that we're going to meet next, has an eschatological nature. All of this is talking about, here's all these ancient dudes who, even though God made these promises to, they didn't see those promises necessarily fulfilled. God's made all these promises to us, and we have not seen them fulfilled, but we still have the same hope those guys had. We have that hope that on the last day, God's going to bring us home. Same faith they had, that's the faith we have. That's what the preacher is trying to tell us. So verses 13 to 15 is basically just an extended explanation of that. So they didn't receive the promises, but... They welcomed them from a distance. They saw the end game. They didn't necessarily get to be in the end game, but they saw it, and they trusted in it. Uh, 
and back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. so, just I spoke about Sarah. Mm -hmm. uh, by her being past the age of childbearing, in, in, in a female situation that would not be it, I kind of see Mary, God doing the same thing to her because she was not married, and uh, right, obviously. Right. So it that that same spirit that God. Uh, I think there's spirit, a, I think there's a parallel there. You know, that God, it, it's God's decision to open the womb. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, so Sarah is kind of a foreshadowing a little bit of the Virgin Mary, I think. Um, yeah, for sure. All right, so the, the parallel God that the preacher is drawing here is from the promised land to the world to come. Mm -hmm. Promised land. These guys didn't see it. They knew the people were going to get it. Their descendants would get it, but they didn't see it. Mm -hmm. uh, even Moses saw it, but he couldn't go in it. But they still believed. But he still had faith. He still had faith. Okay, so in faith, they saw their as yet invisible hereditary possessions, right? So they had this promise of land, a land, a homeland, right? The people of God were going to have a homeland, Canaan. Uh, they didn't see it, but they, in faith, they saw it. They saw that this is the eventual outcome, that this is what God is going to do for them. Uh, it's the same as how we, in, in faith, we see our eventual hereditary possession of the new heavens and the new earth that we're going to be given. We don't see it with our, we don't see it coming with our eyes because we're like, when's the end coming? We don't know. But in the same way they saw the promised land, we see our promised land. So verse, I had a note to go over. We just did that. Right, so these people confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. And they welcomed these promises to be fulfilled from a distance. They didn't actually walk into the promised land, but they welcomed the fulfillment of that promise in their descendants. And likewise, we uh, put our trust and hope in the world to come. Okay, so instead of, verse 16, instead of clinging to their old homeland, which they could have turned around and gone back, they could have gone, yeah, I'm going home. I'm turning around and going home. They did not. So instead of clinging to their ancestral heritage, they longed for something that transcended this body, this life, not going to see it. But we're going to trust that our future children will see it. Exact same thing we do. So instead of clinging to this, because why would you want to? I guess if you have all the money and power in the world, that's very seductive, and that's why a lot of those people don't believe. They don't want to hang on to whatever power and money we have here because this is all there is, because they can't see with faith where it's all going to wind up. Right, and that's what the preacher is pointing to, you know, Longing for something that transcends this body and life. Okay, and then verses 17 to 19, which I jumped way ahead, didn't I? Oh, yeah, we talked about this. So, um, was Isaac really fated to die? I mean, what, what if he hadn't stopped him? Well, it's Abraham in verse 19 believed that God could raise him from. Dead. Right, there you go. Right, so even if he hadn't stayed his hand and he killed him, he believed, okay, I'm going to kill him, but God's going to raise him from the dead because he promised I'm going to have all these descendants and it's got to be through Isaac because Ishmael is not an heir. Okay, he's not a legal heir because he's by, what's her name? Oh, I don't remember. Ha Hagar? Space. Right? Uh, Ishmael. Ishmael. Yeah. Hagar. Yeah, Hagar. So he's, that's where the Muslims come from. They're the Ishmaelites. So, uh, Ishmael's not an heir. He couldn't inherit, so he can't be the one the promise gets carried through. So he goes, okay, he's going to raise Isaac from the dead. So, yeah, Isaac was never going to die. Or if he died, he was still not going to die because he would have raised him again because through Isaac, not only is the world going to be blessed that all your descendants are going to be huge, but guess what? Jesus came through Isaac. 
he's the messianic line. Okay, so Abraham had this faith because he knows God has power over life and death. He believed this by faith. So this is a almost like a parable of the resurrection of the dead. So it's like even if he had killed him, God would raise him from the dead. Even though he sent his son, he sent his son to die and raised him from the dead. So it's also a little a little parallel with the resurrection, the resurrection of the dead on the last day. Uh, we already talked about the three-day journey. He carried his means of execution uh, and the provision of the substitutionary sacrifice uh, is also the foreshadowing of the atonement. Okay, now in verse 20, we have three more examples, but these three examples are examples of Abraham's descendants. Okay, so they're archetypes of the inheritors of God's blessing, the passing on of the inheritance. Okay, so passing on of their inheritance is well-pleasing to God. Isaac blessed, blessed Jacob and Esau. Genesis 27, uh, not only Canaan and Edom, but also uh, that's what they inherited. That was their inheritance, right? So uh, Jacob, the land of Canaan, and Esau, the land of Edom. But also it's, again, foreshadowing our eschatological inheritance. Uh, but Esau forfeited his share because he did not, he failed to heed to serve his brother. That's Genesis 27. Uh, so Esau also teaches us something. He represents those who shrink back from God's promises, uh, which ultimately ends in their own destruction. Uh, Hebrews 10, 39. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have the faith, uh, faith to the pre preserving of the soul. I told you these chapter breaks are not always in the best place, so that verse could almost go with chapter 11. So an example of those who shrink back to destruction, that's Esau. That's what he did. Okay, and then verse 21, Jacob. Okay, by faith, Jacob blessed each of Joseph's sons. Therefore, Joseph got a double share. Uh, that's Genesis 48, 9 to 22, and 49, 22 to 26, if you want to read up on that. Okay, now bowing, he bowed over his staff. How does he say that? Uh, First William 21. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff, which has uh, a meaning. So. What's that all about? I mean, what? Yeah. Um, bowing over his staff recalls how he left to go on his journey uh, to Haran in Genesis 32. So he left with only a staff. So he's got only the staff now he's leaning on. Oh. So it's kind of, he's near the end of his journey, right? Mm -hmm. So his, his race is run. He hasn't reached that promised heavenly homeland yet. So he's bowing over that staff in submission to God's will again. <coughs> again. So when he left home the first time, all he had was a staff. He's getting ready to leave this earth, and all he's got is a staff. Uh -oh. Okay. Right, so that's a, a symbolic, uh, an act of submission and trust, but it's also symbolic of those things. Yeah. Uh, who promised to bring him to where he is now, because he left home with just his staff and God took care of him, right? Yeah. And now he's getting ready to leave and go on another journey. And he's putting his future in God's hands once more. Okay, and then verse 22. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. So though he lived most of his life in Egypt, right? Because he went to Egypt at a pretty young age when his brother sold him. Okay, he didn't consider it his home. There's that stranger in a strange land, a foreigner, right? He commanded his kinsmen to bring his bones to the promised land. It's like, I'm not going to see it in this life, but bring my bones there. That's Genesis 50. Uh, verses 24 to 26. And that also, again, anticipates the future resurrection from the dead. So let's look at that real quick. Because that's an obscure, at the very end of Genesis. 50? Yeah. And that's kind of an obscure passage. So it's all stories we know, and there's obscure stuff right in there, too. Because we don't, you know, 
we don't know this stuff like they did. Because everybody, the preacher's preaching this, everybody's going, oh, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, well, yeah, it's in the book of Moses, first book of Moses. It's at the end. Like, they'll, they'd know exactly. Oh, uh, 24? So, let's see. Genesis 50, verse 24. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land he has promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph bade the sons of Israel swear, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110. And he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. So they mummified him, I guess. Joseph's mummy. Neat. All right, so that again anticipates the future resurrection of the dead. Okay, so now verse 23. Now we're going to get four examples from the life of Moses. So we know Moses was hidden from his parents for three months. That parallels. He had to get dark. Lights on. Uh, I couldn't see. All right, so Moses was hidden by his parents for three months. It symbolizes the three years, right? Three years. Jesus was in Egypt hidden. I believe it was three years. Is it three years? I'm pretty sure it's three years. I do not recall. Luke. Three months. Three. Moses, three. Moses was in three months. Jesus fled to Egypt for three years, I believe. Oh, yeah. What was the weaning time? Uh, I think three years. Yeah, so Joseph got up, took the child his mother while it was still night, and he left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken. I think it was three years. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Two years old. The voice was heard. Blah, blah, blah. Herod died. Go now to the land of Israel. I don't know where I got three years from, but I think it was three years. So that parallels Jesus' flight into Egypt. And then verse 24 is, By faith Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called Pharaoh's daughter. That's a summary of Exodus chapter 2, verses 10 to 15, where he rejected his position, which he had a pretty nice position. He gave up the enjoyment of sin, in quotes because he was the inheritor of a greater promise. So there's that foreshadowing again of faith in something greater. I'm in this foreign land. I'm, I'm native right now, and I'm not going to go native. I'm going to return to my people. Okay, so by faith in that promise, he was looking for a payment of reward, the eschatological world to come. He endured the mockery of the people of God as a type of Christ's rejection by his own people. Okay, so... Jesus was rejected by his own people. Moses was rejected by his own people because they considered him an Egyptian. So he had to endure that humiliation. And likewise, Christ was rejected by all of his own. I mean, he couldn't even preach in his hometown. They wanted to kill him. They tried to throw him off a cliff. Uh, for that one, we can look at Psalm 89. Maybe I actually marked the right psalm this time. There's a psalm for everything. Psalm 89, 50, which says, Remember, O Lord, the reproach of your servants, how I bear in my bosom, the reproach of all the many peoples with which your enemies have reproached, O Lord, which, with which they have reproached the footsteps of your anointed. Let's see. All right, so the preacher is using him as an example to, again, these are Hebrew people converted to Christianity living in Rome who experienced, guess what, mockery for their faith, because look at where they live. All right, they're in Rome. Romans don't know what to do with these guys. Right? They're, they're not quite illegal yet. Kind of, sort of, but not really. They just don't know what to do with them. Uh, they still think, Romans still think they're just a sect of Judaism. 
know, like they're the same people. They're just are a little different because uh, there were sects of Judaism. It wasn't that weird, um, but uh, they pretty much made fun of them. They were like, "Yeah, whatever, you guys. We have all these gods for all this stuff, and you got one god. What good is that?" You know, pagans, they got all kinds of gods. Right, and then verse 27, we are now to, so verse 27 says, By faith he left Egypt, Moses left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured, as seeing him who is unseen. Okay, so verse 27 is not talking about Moses' flight to Midian. He's talking about, that's a foreshadowing of the actual exodus itself. So... Some commentators will probably say, oh, by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. So let's talk about his flight to Midian when he killed that Egyptian uh, taskmaster, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So that is not what he's talking about. That's not his flight. I'm sorry, what verse is that? Uh, verse 27. So by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. That's not talking about his flight to Midian. That's talking about the flight of all God's people from Egypt after the first Passover which uh, talks about by faith he kept the Passover. All right, so by faith in God's promises, he's able to see God by his continual seeing of the unseen one. Okay, so that's, again, the unseen one, the theophany of the word. All right, so when the word manifests himself in the Old Testament, he is not Jesus because Jesus is a human. And God. He's not Jesus yet. He's the Son. He is the incarnate, He is the Word not yet incarnate. Uh, so that's what they call theophany or Christophany, an appearance, a manifestation of the second person of the Trinity in the Old Testament, which is, guess what? The angel of death. The burning bush, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. Uh, his appearance at the holy meal on Mount Sinai, that fire. Um, seeing God's back. Are they all the pre-incarnate? Yep. Okay. Yeah, those are all appearances. Of the, anytime God manifests in the physical world, that's the second person of the Trinity. Yeah, that's the best way to think of it. So if God is manifested to man somehow visibly in the world, that's the second person of the Trinity. Baptism. Hmm? Christ's baptism did with a dove. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So. so. All three of them was there. All three of them was there. Exactly. <laughs> exactly right. So anytime, so you got the burning bush. But basically, anytime you see fire, yeah. that's that's yeah. the sun, right? <laughs> so you got the burning bush, the glory cloud, pillar of fire, the meal on Mount Sinai, which is sparks and volcanic kind of looking stuff. The fourth in the furnace. Yeah, the fourth man in the fiery furnace. Um, what? You want to ask something? Ask it. If you haven't talked about the appearances of the sun in the Old Testament, it's weird when you first start talking about it. Anytime you see fire, really? Not every time. Well, but anytime you see God fire, that's... Okay, well, that's yeah. different. Sorry. Because so, I see fire a lot. Yes. No, anytime you see fire in the Old Testament. Oh, you did see that. And it's God fire, not just like I struck in a man. The cloud. Yeah, I didn't rub two sticks together and there's fire. That's not a theophany. But if God makes the fire, yeah, it's probably yeah. God. Manifesting. You needed that clarified. Yes. Thank you. And the cloud. Yeah, and because the cloud. The cloud was also in the right, So, burning bush, cloud, glory cloud. I mean, the cloud, the glory cloud rested on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. Who else can that be other than exactly. the Son? Right. The second person of the Trinity. Even at the Red Sea, uh, the cloud went behind them so that Egypt could not see. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Where is normally was in front of that. Yeah, and even when uh, Moses saw God's back, he didn't see the Father's back. Right, right. He saw that's a manifest that's a, a manifestation of the Son, and then also uh, the sight of the Lord's form that was in Numbers twelve. It's Numbers twelve. Numbers 12, verse 7. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. When I speak mouth to mouth, even openly, and not in dark sayings, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant against Moses? 
So that's beholding the form. So when like Moses comes out and he's all glowy and he had a cover of his face because he was beholding the manifestation of God. He's not looking at the Father. Nobody can do that. Right, but he's looking at the manifestation of the second person of the Trinity because anytime physical form is needed, that is the Son's action. So that is the Word's action. Angels? Yeah. Anytime it says angel of the Lord, just about, that's the Son. That's a theophany. Okay. Yeah, so if the angel of the Lord came to somebody, that's meant like Jacob wrestled with the angel mm -hmm. all night. That's the second person of the Trinity. Well, my yeah. finger just went into Numbers, uh, uh, yeah. whatever, 22, with Balaam. You know, when the angel would admit the donkey. You know, it's the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow passage between the vineyards. So when, so when the donkey talked... <laughs> That's the word. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. If he use a donkey, he use anybody. That's what the greatest line in that one Luther movie is like. Even if, if God could speak from the mouth of an ass, <laughs> it's when he was first started as professor. He goes, "Well, hey, you know," I said, well, "How can I be a professor?" But if you know, if God can talk from the mouth of an ass. <laughs> Everybody said, "Big laugh." Ha ha! That's funny. <laughs> Theology humor. Uh, yeah. So then, verse twenty-eight again. Uh, Moses' faithful institution of the Passover didn't focus on the meal, and the focus in Hebrews is not on the meal, because that was a, that's a big deal, because we've been talking about that meal for like three weeks in church on Sunday, so yeah, that, but that's not what, what's important, what's being focused on in verse 28. Okay, by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. All right, so the faithful institution of the Passover is faith in the blood markers. Okay, so you had the post on the lintels and the doorpost, the lintel and the doorpost. You had to put the blood on that so that you would know that the destroyer would pass over. Okay, which points forward to trusting in the blood shed by Christ from the cross. Okay, so that blood is shed to seal those in that household from death. Okay, so by faith, the congregation now listening to the preacher because they are marked by the blood of Christ, washed clean by it in the water of baptism, just like the passage through the Red Sea led those people to safety, just like Noah and his family passed through the flood uh, while the Egyptians uh, did not so much as survive. And then verse 30, faith is a gift given by God. That's Joshua 6. So the walls of Jericho fell down after they'd been encircled for seven days. Okay, so by faith, they circled Jericho until the walls fell down. And that is an example of receptive faith. So it encourages the preachers, encouraging his congregation and encouraging us that no earthly city can hold out against God if he doesn't want it to. Now that's important for these people. Why? What city do they live in? Rome. Rome. What's Rome called? Rome's nickname is, anybody? Bueller, anyone? The Eternal City, yeah. right? Rome is the Eternal, to this day, it's called the Eternal City. Mm. So it's the Eternal City, unless God says it's not, mm. okay? So these people who are strangers in a strange land, in but not of the world, living in the middle of pagan Rome, if God says this city's gonna fall, it's gonna fall. You can take that in a bank. We have it seven days complete. Right? There's a number seven again. Hmm. <laughs> that number must mean something. What would if they, what if they only walk, ran around six times? What would have happened? Nothing. Nothing. Just fall short. <laughs> no. See, that's why, not, not to harp on Revelation again, but that's why the number of the beast is 666. Exactly. It's the unholy yeah, the trinity. Right. It's one short yeah. because the devil tries to be God and he never makes it. Right. He always falls short. So the unholy trinity is short, short, and short again. And it's also our number. It's a human number. Satan is an angel, fallen angel, but he's still an angel. It's our number because we want to be God too. That's, exactly. We've done that since day one. You, if you eat this, you'll be like God. Okay. Nope. Not, not didn't work out so well. So that number is one short of perfection. Can't get there. Try all you want, you're never going to make it. It can't be done. 
All right, so enough about the number of the beast because that's not what we're talking about. Uh, okay, so no earthly city is going to hold out against God and his pre priestly people, even the city of Rome. If God wants Rome to fall, it's going to fall. And it did, eventually. Okay, verse 31, that's Joshua chapter 2. Rahab the harlot, which is an obscure reference to, we don't know this story that well. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she welcomed the spies in peace. So Rahab alone was saved when Jericho was destroyed. So, And her family. And her family. Yeah, I, yeah, I was just thinking. Right. <laughs> okay, so even though she's a sinner, yeah. she's a prostitute. Oh, she's a prostitute. When she heard what God had done in Egypt, she believed, let the spies in, confessed her faith, risked her own life by faith, and... God, I sneeze. I hate that. I see it. Ugh, I hate that. Okay. So, even though she was a sinner, because, oh, wow, you know, Jesus you know, ate with prostitutes and stuff. Well... Mary Magdalene is a prostitute. Story for another time. Uh, she believed, she let the spies in, confessed her faith, and then relied on that faith, risked her own life. How was her faith rewarded? She's God to Jesus. Jesus. Genealogy. She's in the genealogy of Christ. Oh, I didn't know that part. The Messiah came from a line of prostitutes and <laughs> sinners. <laughs> yeah. How about that? Yep, so she was even privileged to be in the line of the ancestry of the Messiah. Okay, so in all kinds of times and in all kinds of ways, right, the kind of faith that's generated by God's word, which is the basis of their hope. So this faith has to be generated by something. The only way it's generated today because God doesn't talk to us from burning bushes and asses and clouds, okay? Yeah, I know. I, I kind of left a little hanging fruit with that one. You should have taken the opportunity. It's like, really? Really? He doesn't? Okay. People are going to be listening to this on the corner and go, what? I don't get it. Oh, wait, I do get it. They're saying the pastor? Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, okay, so the basis of the hope, the, ba the hypostasis, all right? what they hope, and hope to receive from God, and that evidence being provided for what is unseen in this age. So this whole chapter has been talking about all these old dead believers that had a promise, they didn't see that promise fulfilled, but they were counted as righteous because they had faith that those promises would come true. And that is the evidence, look at the evidence, these people had faith, and God rewarded them because you saw, we see those promises fulfilled. That's history. That's fact. These things happen. So that is evidence for what is unseen in this age, in the age of the people hearing this for the first time in Rome and to us today because everything has happened before and everything will happen again. That's the best line from the Battlestar Galactica reboot was they kept saying that. All these things have happened before. All these things that will happen again it was part of the mythology of, of where they came from, which they ripped right from the Bible, because all these things happened before, and they're going to keep happening. Right? So all of this faith provides our evidence for our conviction of the things that we have not seen yet that will be revealed in the age to come. And that's the end of the chapter. That's a good time. Yeah. That's a good chapter. Like I said, it's, it's, it gets really good at the end. These last three chapters are just like bang, bang, bang. Okay, so next week we're going to talk about now that we're counted as righteous because we have this assurance, this faith, in that we are convinced by the evidence of these people of faith in the past that we will be, these rewards, these promises that we're being made are going to come to fruition. What does that mean now? Because we're still here. So how do we participate in God's holiness? Because he ascribes his righteousness, Christ's righteousness to us. He counts us as holy. That's what all those chapters before about talking about priests being consecrated, and now we don't have them anymore because we're a royal priesthood. We're consecrated as priests, which means we're holy, but we're still sinners. We're saints, too. Well, okay.
okay, so now the preacher is going to go drive home that point in the next chapter about living in God's holiness. And then finally, in the last chapter, now that we'll put all the pieces together, now you, Hebrews in Rome, and now you, here at Grace Lutheran Church, how do you live as members of the holy congregation of God's people who are in, not of this world? And that's how the book will conclude. So good stuff coming in the next two chapters. This is good stuff. Like, you saw how much we could get out of two verses of this book, right? Because there's just so much there. It's like, yeah, preaching's kind of gone downhill in 2,000 years. It's kind of hard to top that. Like, okay, can you stop? Like, you gave us 13 chapters. I, I'm going to take, like, one verse home and think about it. Then you're going to have to read me the whole thing again. Yeah. So anyway, that's where we will end. Until uh, next time, unless you have questions, comments. Mine is digging. You must be looking for something. I'm sorry? Or you look like you're digging for something good. <laughs> amuse, amuse, as the kids say. Um, um, uh, Rahab. Uh, okay, so by, by faith, Rahab uh, uh, welcomed spies in the peace. And, mm-hmm. Okay. Um, James one. chapter... We should do a Bible study on James. I think we'll do James after Acts. <laughs> James is short yeah. and packed. Yeah. And uh, it was explaining that, because in James, uh, James, James 2, 25, excuse me. <coughs> okay. In, in the, the same, same way, way was not it? Rahab the harlot also justified by her works when she received the messengers and sent them out of another way. Right. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So the, thing, the comment was about here. Where she, she, so was she justified by works? No. <laughs> no. She couldn't help but do them right. because she was justified by exactly. faith. Exactly. Yeah, it was good. a reflex. It was automatic. James is good stuff. But you see, James doesn't beat you over the head with it. He goes, well, wasn't she justified by her works then? And then he just stops. And like everybody's supposed to go, no, she wasn't. Like, good, then you get it. Her faith was authenticated. Mm. Authenticated. Or shown genuine by her works. These verses address the different aspects of salvation and do not contradict each other. Mm-hmm. The grammar in James is... Mm-hmm. Okay, so they, did they publish... Yeah, they published the Concordia Commentary on James. And it's like, you see how small the book is, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's that thick. It's like, how are they going to do five chapter well, Philemon is one page in your Bible. Yeah. You know how big the Concordia commentary on Philemon is? It's that thick. Oh. It's like, there's like 24 verses. The commentary is like 800 pages. The, the comment, there's a lot of background stuff about like slavery in the Bible, slavery in the New Testament. It like gets into a lot of stuff because you kind of have to. But it's like, it's one page. It's one page. <laughs> They're nothing if not thorough. Little is much in the hands of God. So we get one page, get a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, honestly, I don't know why I gotta read the whole thing. We need John three sixteen and seventeen. Uh, Dr. Bill, are you talking about uh, today? Too, I was reading uh, Moses and Noah. Mm-hmm. Moses in the basket, pitch, tar, the ark, in the water, saved, uh-huh, uh-huh. As the, and then the same thing with Noah, in the specks, pitch, and tar, uh-huh. you know, and both beginning to uh, the, the, the preservation, put it that way. And also both uh, archetypes of baptism. Uh-huh. Yeah, if you, like, if you like hymns, look at Water, Blood, and Spirit Crying by Stephen Starkey. It's in our hymnal. I don't remember what number it is. Uh, you can probably find on YouTube, you can probably find the choral version of of the uh, hymn, okay. which we did it at a pastor's installation. It's gorgeous. It's way better than the one that's in the hymnal, which is just for the congregation. What's so, the name of it? It's called Water, Blood, and Spirit Crying. And that's one of the verses. You know, it's talking about, it, it, the text is drawn from Genesis. And then it's also talking about how Christ is the ark of life. Mm-hmm. So the basket and the ark are archetypes of Christ. Right. And uh, 
Yeah, Stephen Starkey is, is he's still alive. Uh, he wrote his hymns, or he passed away, I don't remember. But uh, that, those hymns were written in the 50s, I want to say, 1950s. I mean, they're r relatively new by hymn standards. But, uh, and there's a lot of Stephen Starkey hymns in the hymnal. They're all very difficult to sing because he's a musician. They, they're, they're, they were meant to be sung by choirs. But they're pretty. We do pretty good. We sing it all the time. We sing it on the spirit like three or four times a year. It's my favorite hymn. So, good stuff. All right, that is where we will leave it for this week.